practice test three. This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract, and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with the information you hear. Now, look at the notes for extract 1. Part A. Extract 1. Questions 1 to 12. You hear a GP talking to a patient called Kate Tully. For questions 1 to 12, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello, I'm Kevin Peters, one of the GPs here today. What would you like me to call you? You can call me Kate. Okay, so what's brought you here today, Kate? How can I help? I don't know. It's silly. I don't think it's silly. Please tell me a bit about what's going on. I can't cope anymore. I... Take your time, Kate. I know it can't be easy. I'm, I'm just feeling really overwhelmed. It's all just a bit too much. Okay, and how long have you been feeling like this? For the last three months or so. So just after you had your baby? Yeah, that's right. Okay, would you mind if I ask you about your mood? How is your mood of late? I I'm just fed up with everything, really. It feels like I'm trying to swim in honey, or some other, like, really tough liquid... I cry a lot more over the most pathetic things. Just the other day, I boarded a bus and was a pound short of the full fare. I, I couldn't help it. I started to cry. The driver was really nice about it and he let me on, but it's just over the slightest thing. I understand. What about sleep? How are you sleeping? Do you get much sleep, Kate? I spend most of the night looking up at the ceiling, hoping I don't wake up the next day. But knowing that I have to for him. Oh dear. For him? For my little boy. What's his name? James. <laughs> we named him after my granddad. My granddad would love to meet him. He has his smile. I'm sure he would have. What about your partner? Is your partner supportive? Yeah. He suggested that I come today. And Alistair's great with him and he helps with the nappies and the feeds as much as he can. That's good. I just wish I didn't feel like this. I wish I could snap my fingers and feel better. If you don't mind me saying, you're not alone. Postpartum depression affects more than one in ten women. Have you ever heard of postpartum depression? Only what I've seen on the telly. But I always thought it affected people in their mid to late forties or, or people who had depression before they started having children. I can see why you would think that. A lot of people think the same way of the condition, but really it usually affects new parents, and they can be of any age, from any walk of life. It can last up to one year, but it usually passes when you get the right help. Medication? That's one way. Do you have family and friends close by? Not really. I moved here for work about three years ago. Most of my family and friends live back up... up north at home. That's okay. Now that I think about it, there are some support groups that meet weekly with new parents who understand what it's like to be in your shoes. I'd like to put you in touch with the coordinator, Angela, if that's okay. Can I just take a number and think about it? Of course. 
You've come at the right time, and if things were much worse, I would refer you to a perinatal mental health specialist. But right now, I think we can manage this together with some of the help we're thinking about, right? Yes, I can try. I just want to be better for James and for my partner. And so you will. Please remember, Kate, having a baby is a stressful experience, and I think you're doing very well. It takes time to get used to looking after a new baby, but it does get easier, I promise you, and you have lots of people around you to help, okay? Thanks. That means a lot. I'd also like to see you again, if that's okay, in two weeks' time. Just to catch up, find out how you, James, and Alistair are doing. You can bring them along if you'd like to. Okay, Dr. Peters. Please call me Kevin. Do you feel any better? Yes, thank you for seeing me. I'm glad you came, Kate. If you need anything, anything at all, even if it's just to have a chat, give me a call, okay? Extract 2, questions 13 to 24. You hear a speech therapist talking to a patient, Ross Meller. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello, Mr. Meller. How are things coming along? I'm very well. And before we start today's consultation, I just wanted to say that I'm really happy with the way things have been coming along. When I came the first time, I couldn't get through a sentence without my stammer, and I used to feel so lonely and isolated. Ever since our meetings, though, I'm not stammering nearly as much. I'm even giving full speeches as well, so I'm well chuffed with that. It's not all the time, just occasionally. I'm very happy for you, Mr. Meller, especially because this is a stammer that you'd had for quite a while, wasn't it? Yes, it is. Ever since I was a little boy, in fact, about 10 years old. It's started when I was in school and carried on throughout for, for about six years. It used to be classed as severe back then, but I suppose nowadays, now that I see you, it'd be considered more mild. My mum says that she didn't book me in with a therapist back then because she didn't want me to start to feel self-conscious about myself or for the kids at school to start picking on me. Not that it helped much. My great uncle was really helpful at the time, though. He had a stammer as a child, too. I was going to ask you that. You see, we usually find that a stammer has a genetic component. Was he the only one in your family with the condition? That I know of, yes. On your mother's side or your father's side? Fathers, he was my rock growing up, and he made sure to teach me to believe in m myself and not let anybody push me around. I don't know how I would have coped if it wasn't for him, and I hope he rests in peace. Uh, admittedly, I don't know much else about my genetic history. OK, I'll add that to the notes. We're trying to build a genetic map at the practice, you see, and all the information we can get about our patients will help us become better as a clinic. Oh? Well, I notice that I usually start to stammer when I'm th thinking about the past, like when I'm recalling memories and things. Do you think that past trauma has anything to do with stammering? That's a good question, Mr. Meller, and the short answer is that I don't know. I will certainly look into it, though. I'm intrigued that you've been thinking about it that way. What else have you noticed? I've noticed that sometimes I can go a long stretch without it if I'm really concentrating on it, or when I'm reading or singing. Do you sing much? Recently, yes. I joined a choir as soon as I found out that it was helping. We meet weekly on Sundays and put on little mini-concerts. I really enjoy it. Which genre? M modern funk. I know it sounds weird, but it's a really up-and-coming type of music. You should come and check us out one day, if you have the time. Thank you for the invitation. You're welcome, and I'm really glad you could see me today. I volunteered to introduce the choir at our next meeting. 
It sounds like you're looking forward to it. I kind of am. The hall is likely to be packed full of p people, and I find that each time I get on stage, I get a bit of a rush. Would you consider doing something like that full time? What, singing or presenting? Both. Either. You see, with you being a laboratory assistant, I presume you don't have many opportunities to do public speaking. You're right about that. I sit in a cubicle most days. I don't even have a phone, so I really don't get to communicate much with the outside world. I thought as much. Now that we're making so much progress, the last thing I want is for you to shy away from your newfound talents. Don't encourage me. This is how d delusion sets in. Next thing you know, I'll be getting rejected from reality TV singing contests because I thought I could sing. <laughs> OK, a y well, today we're going to work on some exercises that you can use before any of your speeches. It's a warm-up exercise that will help your tongue to relax and your jaw as well, OK? OK. a y I'd like you to move your head to the side as though you're looking at something to your right. You'll feel a stretch on your neck. Hold that position for about a minute and breathe deeply the whole time, OK? OK. a y Then I'd like you to move your head to the side as though you're looking at something to your left until you feel a stretch on the other side. Again, hold this for about a minute. Then we'll get some air flowing. Can you do a chewing motion for me like you're chewing a big piece of gum and creating some space in your mouth? That is the end of part A. You now have two minutes to check your work. Part B. In this part of the test, there are six short extracts relating to the work of health professionals. For questions 25 to 30, choose answer A, B or C, which you think best fits according to the text. Question 25. You hear a pharmacist revising for an exam. Now read the question. The common pharmacological agents used for cardiac failure are 1. Diuretics, including thiazides, loop diuretics, and potassium sparing. This type of drug is used with the aim to reduce the edema. 2. 
angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors, or angiotensin receptor blockers, with the aim to produce neurohormonal modification, vasodilatation with the consequent improvement in ventricular ejection fraction. 3. Beta-adrenergic blockers are used for neurohormonal modification, prevention of arrhythmias. 4. Aldosterone antagonists used as an additive treatment to produce diuresis and reduction in cardiac workload. 5. Digoxin with improvement in the symptoms of heart failure. 6. Anticoagulants to decrease the risk of thromboembolism. 7. Inotropic agents, if the patient is hospitalized, to restore organ perfusion and reduce congestion. The non-pharmacological treatment includes patient education about heart failure symptoms. If necessary, dietary counseling about sodium and fluid restriction of less than 2 liters per day is considered when there is evidence of fluid retention. Question 26 you hear dentists talking about new equipment. Now read the question. It's arrived! What has? Oh wow, is that the ultrasonic scalar 3000? I can't believe it's real. It's so shiny. Did you know that this thing won Gadget of the Year at last year's Dental Expo? Yes, I did. And believe it, mate, we'll be the leading. Periodontal disease doesn't stand a chance at this practice. Up until now, we've had to make do with mediocre kit. But now, we've just stepped up our game. That's all very well and all, but that must have cost a pretty penny. That's hardly the point. There's no point sacrificing quality over a price tag. You've got a point there. But will the patients really notice a difference? I mean, what was wrong with our old scaling equipment? Spoken like a true dinosaur. We get it. You're more experienced with old kit. Get with the times, Roger. Your age is showing. Question 27. You hear speech therapists on a retreat. Now read the question. I have to say, if we're going to spend six days talking about the interaction of speech therapy with autism, then we've certainly picked a great place to do it. That's right. So long as we leave the Great Lakes with better understanding of speech learning difficulties... This does seem rather niche, though. How many autistic patients have trouble producing speech sounds effectively? It's a significant amount, Shannon. Maybe one in three. Gosh, that's a lot. True. And that's what we're here to tackle. There are many communication impediments that start with problems with speech. I suppose comprehension would be an issue there too. That's right. A person with autism may have problems understanding the meaning of the words outside the context where they were learned. The bulk of our work this weekend will be focused on these areas. Can we teach our patients the skills they need to handle communication in various contexts? You've lost me. We can look at helping the person understand verbal and non-verbal communication or understanding others' intentions across a range of different settings. Question 28. You hear part of a medical podcast. Now read the question. Axillary nerve dysfunction is a condition categorized by loss of sensation or movement in the shoulder. It is also referred to as neuropathy of the axillary nerve. Axillary nerve dysfunction is caused by excessive damage or stress to the axillary nerve, which serves the deltoid muscles and the skin of the shoulder. Nerve disorders may occur in the myelin sheath, 
The myelin sheath covers and protects the nerve or its axon. When these areas are damaged, it results in a reduction of impulsive transmission within the nerve. Axillary nerve dysfunction may be caused by excessive stress or blunt trauma on the nerve for a prolonged period of time, pressure mounted on the axillary nerve by other body organs, moving beyond the normal range which can occur with a hypoextension injury to the shoulder. When a person stresses his limbs by going beyond a comfortable range of motion, it may cause issues with the axillary and other nerves. Question 29. You hear two nurses discussing a difficult case. Now read the question. Have you got a minute? Of course. What's the matter? I had a patient come to see me today. She told me that she was going bald, and when I assessed her, she told me that there were small, coin-sized, round patches of baldness on her scalp, even though I could see that her hair was otherwise OK. I've never seen anything like it. I booked her in with Dr Winters, and I've been reading up on some hair loss conditions, but I can't understand it. Are you familiar with alopecia? That's one of the conditions I came across, but I can't understand how she's got that. It can be caused by anything. Stress, for example, particularly events such as bereavement, separation and accidents, occasionally appears to be a trigger for alopecia areata. She's quite young, only 25. A little too young to be dealing with this. Well, alopecia can affect anyone at any age. Has your patient been through a stressful experience recently? She didn't mention anything to me. Stress, particularly events such as a death of someone close or a separation and accidents, can act as a trigger. Well, I didn't ask. Maybe she has. I did my best to reassure her anyway. And I'm sure you did. Don't worry. I'm sure she's in good hands with Tim. Question 30. You here? part of an episode of a medical TV show called Bulby City. Now read the question. Mrs J, you've asked to chat to me today as I've been informed that you're unhappy about your son's choice to be an organ donor. Is that the case? He didn't mention anything about it to me. It wasn't until one of the nurses, Nina, mentioned it to me that I had any idea. Why would he want his body to be divided up? He must not have been thinking straight. Mrs J, our records show that your son made his choice to become a donor a few years ago and registered online... He was over 18, and it was his choice to help provide life-saving transplants for patients. I can't believe he'd make that choice without being pressured into it. I don't understand why. I realise it's upsetting, but many people choose to become organ donors to help those in desperate need, those who could benefit from organs that are no longer required by the donor. It's an amazing thing that your son has chosen to do. And I'd love for you to read some of the testimonials from others who've been given a second chance at life from the generosity of others. Look, I do realize that it's a good thing and all, but I'm just upset as it wasn't what I'd expected. I'd never even considered organ donation and just need a bit of time to get used to the idea, you know? I just need to come to terms with everything. I understand, and I know exactly how you feel, as even as a medical professional, I was unsure of the idea until I met some of the transplant patients whose lives had been saved. Okay, so can I meet some of them too then? I'm not sure, but I'm sure we can arrange some more information on it. Leave it with me, and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you. Part C. In this part of the test, there are two texts about different aspects of healthcare. 
For questions 31 to 42, choose answer A, B or C, which you think best fits according to the text. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You hear a doctor, Hetty Horner, delivering a presentation on Ascalation. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. My name is Dr. Hetty Horner, and I'm a physician with a keen interest in sound in my field. Today, I'd like to talk to you about osculation. Osculation is the term for listening to the internal sounds of the body, usually using a stethoscope. Osculation is performed for the purposes of examining the circulatory system and respiratory system, heart sounds and breath sounds as well as the gastrointestinal system, bowel sounds. It is an integral part of physical examination of a patient and is routinely used to provide strong evidence in including or excluding different pathological conditions that are manifested clinically in the patient. The stethoscope comprises a bell and a diaphragm. The bell is most effective in transmitting lower frequency sounds, while the diaphragm is most effective at transmitting higher frequency sounds. In other words, the bell is designed to hear low-pitched sounds and the diaphragm is designed to hear high-pitched sounds. They are connected via rubber tubing to the ear pieces. These should be worn facing forward as the ear canals run anteriorly. Osculation is a skill that requires substantial clinical experience, a fine stethoscope, and good listening skills. Health professionals, doctors, nurses, etc., listen to three main organs and organ systems during osculation, the heart, the lungs, and the gastrointestinal system. When osculating the heart, doctors listen for abnormal sounds, including heart murmurs, gallops, and other extra sounds coinciding with heartbeats. Heart rate is also noted. When listening to lungs, breath sounds such as wheezes, crepitations, and crackles are identified. The gastrointestinal system is osculated to note the presence of bowel sounds. Electronic stethoscopes can be recording devices and can provide noise reduction and signal enhancement. This is helpful for purposes of telemedicine, remote diagnosis, and teaching. This opened the field to computer-aided osculation. Ultrasonography, U.S., inherently provides capability for computer-aided osculation. And portable U.S., especially portable echocardiography, replaces some stethoscope osculation, especially in cardiology. Although not nearly all of it, stethoscopes are still essential in basic checkups, listening to bowel sounds, and other primary care context. 
To optimize the effectiveness of osculation, the surroundings should be 1. Quiet. The ambient noise might interfere with the heart and lung sounds. 2. Warm, so that the patient feels comfortable while the upper part of the body is being exposed. Also, it's to avoid shivering that may add noise. 3. Appropriate lighting, to allow good coordination between visual and osculatory findings. Why is osculation used? Abnormal sounds may indicate problems in these areas. Lungs, abdomen, heart, major blood vessels. Potential issues can include irregular heart rate, Crohn's disease, phlegm, or fluid buildup in your lungs. Your doctor can also use a machine called a Doppler ultrasound for osculation. This machine uses sound waves that bounce off your internal organs to create images. This is also used to listen to your baby's heart rate when you're pregnant. Osculation gives your doctor a basic idea of what's occurring in your body. Your heart, lungs, and other organs in your abdomen can all be tested using osculation and other similar methods. For example, if your doctor doesn't identify a fist-sized area of dullness left of your sternum, you might be tested for emphysema. Also, if your doctor hears what's called an opening snap when listening to your heart, you might be tested for mitral stenosis. You might need additional tests for a diagnosis, depending on the sounds your doctor hears. Osculation and related methods are a good way for your doctor to know whether or not you need close medical attention. Osculation can be an excellent preventative measure against certain conditions. Ask your doctor to perform these procedures whenever you have a physical exam. There are alternatives to osculation. Other methods that your doctor can use to determine what's happening inside of your body are palpitation and percussion. Your doctor can perform a palpitation simply by placing their fingers over one of your arteries to measure systolic pressure. Doctors usually look for a point of maximal impact, PMI, around your heart. If your doctor feels something abnormal, they can identify possible issues related to your heart. Abnormalities may include a large PMI or thrill. A thrill is a vibration caused by your heart that's felt on the skin. So how does the doctor diagnose the condition? Using percussion involves your doctor tapping their fingers on various parts of your abdomen. Your doctor uses percussion to listen for sounds based on the organs or body parts underneath your skin. You'll hear hollow sounds when your doctor taps body parts filled with air and much duller sounds when your doctor taps above bodily fluids or an organ, such as your liver. Percussion allows your doctor to identify many heart-related issues based on the relative dullness of sounds. Conditions that can be identified using percussion include enlarged heart, which is called cardiomegaly, excessive fluid around the heart, which is called pericardial effusion, emphysema, Extract 2, questions 37 to 42. You hear an interview with Dr. Luke Cox about sepsis and its prognosis and treatment. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42.
Hello, my name is Dr. Luke Cox, and I'd like to talk to you about sepsis, a condition that remains one of the oldest concepts in the field of medicine. The non-medical term for sepsis is blood poisoning, which is how it is known in common parlance. The clinical definition of sepsis has evolved tremendously over the past two decades. Sepsis was initially thought to be a systemic infection linked with microbes which manifested with hypothermia, tachycardia, and rise in white blood cell levels. In the modern science, however, sepsis is clinically defined as the severe systemic immune response to an infection. The body responds to a new source of contamination by sending chemicals to fight the foreign body, otherwise termed as an antigen. The inflammatory chemicals then trigger a widespread inflammation in the body. The inflammatory reaction in most cases becomes severe and leads to the destruction of blood vessels among other vital transport structures in the body. The result is tissue ischemia since the essential body organs can no longer receive a sufficient amount of oxygen and nutrients. In severe cases, multiple organ failure ensues which complicates death. The diagnostic criteria are altered mental state, increased respiratory rate, and abnormally low blood pressure. Almost anyone can develop the disease, but there are risk factors for the non-contagious disease. Certain predisposing factors expose certain individuals to a higher risk of being infected as compared to others. Very young, children under one year, and the geriatric population are, for instance, at a higher risk of sepsis due to their compromised immune state. Another group of people with a higher risk of septic infection are individuals whose immune systems are impaired because of pathologies or pharmacological regimens. They include cancer patients on long-term chemotherapy, patients on long-term steroids and immunosuppressant medication. Additionally, Pregnant women who have either had a miscarriage or abortion will be at a higher chance of getting infected. The diagnosis of sepsis proves problematic since other medical conditions presenting with almost the same signs and symptoms. The majority of the differential diagnosis for sepsis is similar in patterns of clinical presentations. The pathophysiological pathways of sepsis lead to tremendous effects in the pulmonary and neurological systems. In neurological systems, the patient presents with altered mental status as demonstrated by lethargy, adjusted level of consciousness, confusion, and delirium. The pulmonary system is affected as well. Septic patients will clinically manifest with tachycardia. High fevers exceeding 38 degrees Celsius is also an indicator of sepsis. The diagnosis of sepsis takes a combined technique whereby the physician used the results of clinical assessments along with the blood investigations such as full hemogram results to diagnose sepsis. According to the guidelines provided by the Surviving Sepsis Campaigns, SSC, for the management of severing sepsis, the control should be done in two organized bundles. The initial treatment involves the provision of cardiopulmonary resuscitation and mitigation the threats as presented by the uncontrolled sepsis. In this stage of management, the resuscitative attempts are optimized by a continuous flow of intravenous fluids such as sodium chloride and Ringer's lactate. Oxygen therapy and mechanical ventilation are initiated as indicated. The nurse responsible at this stage should ensure taking and recording of the vital signs of the patient as shown. Also, intravenous administration of empirical antibiotics should be started as quickly as possible. This stage of primary care covers the first six hours. In the second bundle of management, the patient is transferred to the intensive care unit, ICU, for further management following stabilization. In the ICU, the nurses and physicians will be focused on the support of the functions of the vital body organs and the prevention of complications. At this stage, continuous infusion with intravenous fluids and antibiotics is necessary to maintain high levels of antibiotic levels in the blood. The patient also receives doses of antipyretics to control fever. 
The nurse in this stage has a role in providing intensive care to the ill patient. Periodic assessments and plan of responsibility of the individual patient according to their needs are crucial. Generally speaking, the prognosis depends on how serious the sepsis is and the individual's overall health. The elderly tend to have the worst. That is the end of part C. You now have two minutes to check your work.